<laughs> okay, welcome, Gloria. We are really happy to have you here. Thank you for having me. Hi, Gloria. Okay, please, Hi, everybody, introduce yourself, and Gloria is gonna start because if I mute all, then do you have do you have any introduction about Gloria, or she will do it? I her. do. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay, <laughs> you can start, Gloria. Okay, shukran. Doctor Gloria. Can you see my um, screen? No, we see you. Did you share? Uh, how do I share my screen? <laughs> how do I share my screen? Okay, I'll pause recording again. Wait. More. I'm smarter when I'm caffeinated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the process of. <laughs> okay. Okay. Ha. Welcome to my class, Medical Ethics for Real Life. That's me. It would be great if it moved. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for sharing a Sunday morning with me. Sabah al-Her. When it applies, that's me when I shower. Um, let me try this. Ana Gloria. Ana Dr. Min Piru. Arabi Shreya. Um, so I used to be a doctor back home. I have a professional certificate of translation and interpreting for UCSD extension, and I taught for this program. I'm both CMI and CHI Spanish. I became a court interpreter last week. Woo. So if I can do it, so can you. Um, core faculty for NCI, which is a National Center for Interpretation of the University of Arizona. I'm the instructor of Blue Orpi. That's my own company, where I teach fun and interesting webinars for medical and court interpreters. And last year I was, um, I received the honor of being Chia's trainer of the year. So that's why I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this is why my intro of like, this is why you should listen to what I say. The reason why I created this class, uh, and when you ask me which one would you like to teach, I'm like this one, because um, I run a Facebook group for medical translators and interpreters. It's completely free to join. I share a lot of resources that have to do with what I'm doing or if someone asks a question because I'm a translator and interpreter. So that's what I do. And I also belong to our Facebook groups. And I noticed that a lot of questions that pop up that have to do with ethics, very simple to fix if you know ethics. But if you don't know them, that's when you get in trouble. And sometimes I see it's kind of like medicine that the disease, you catch it when it's really advanced instead of at the beginning. So if you had done this ethical thing, it wouldn't have advanced that much. That's why I decided to put this class together because this is how we stay out of trouble. And when someone asks us to do something we shouldn't do, that's how we also stay out of trouble and say no politely because no one likes to hear la. Okay. But first, what I want you to do is I want you to look at the light. What I want you to do is to forget everything you have learned for the test because the ethics you learn from the test do not apply to real life. What I'm going to teach you today is how to stay out of trouble in real life. And this is, these cases are based on things that have happened to me, to colleagues, or things I've seen on Facebook that are really interesting. So what's ethics? I'm just going to give you a little bit of a theory. Ethics teaches us what's good from bad. The problem is um, it doesn't have to do with religion or common sense, because sometimes common sense is not that common, but what the whole profession thinks is good or bad. And then standards of practice is how to apply this ethics to our profession. And they're called standards of professional practice because all interpreters should be able to reach to the same conclusions based on these rules. So that's why I like to equate it to uh, the rules of the road. So ethics is knowing that that sign means you have to stop, okay? And standards of practice is if there's three cars that get to a four stop section, who goes first? So you see what's the difference? Yes, ways, okay? 
So all my sources are this, the National Council on Interpreting Healthcare, NCIHC, they have a code of ethics that has nine tenets. And then the standards of, standards of practice that are 32 that are dependent on the nine. If you want, I can share the documents with you guys later. They're free, but I have them on PDF. Actually in my group, there's a file section and you can also find them there, but I can just, we can, I can give them to Zenny so she can put them there too. Uh, IMIA also has a code of ethics and standards of practice. Usually when I teach, I like the NCIHC organization, how it's organized much better because it's really well explained and I like things when they're organized and make sense. The IMIA are very similar, but I prefer the way the um, NCIHC is organized. And the California Standards for Healthcare Interpreters, that's where we got what we call the pre-session that I will explain in a little bit. The, the way I'm going to do the class is we're going to do a question and then an answer. So if you want to participate, I think it would be good. Maybe to the end. Situation. The patient doesn't let me, the interpreter, talk. She keeps interrupting me. She says she doesn't trust me because she doesn't know who sent me. The insurance company, her former boss, her attorney. What do you do? In this case, the patient doesn't know who you are, doesn't know who sent you, which in the, in, in the big scheme of things, it doesn't matter who paid you because as interpreters, we are um, unbiased, right? We're like Switzerland. We have nothing to do with anyone. But the thing is, we, should, we would have prevented that if when we get there or when the patient gets there, we do the pre-session. So the pre-session is, have you seen how when you buy any type of machine, like a coffee maker or a um, fancy um, device, you have a user manual, right? That usually is like this. The pre-session is like this little short user manual that shows you how to um, use an interpreter. So a lot of interpreters are like, oh, I don't like doing the pre-session, it's stupid, blah, blah. But I like doing it because it shows the patient how, to, how I'm going to work with him or her. And it makes my life so much easier as an interpreter because I'm telling him the rules of the game or her. And then when something happens, they already know what I told them. So I usually tell them my name and that's when the language is included. And uh, I check with them if they have worked with an interpreter before either, because we're supposed to do the pre-session with the patient and the provider, but you know how it is in real life, you never have time to talk to the provider because they're always like, like a McDonald's, like choo, choo, choo. And then you explain your role and you're going to tell them things that emphasize that your communication is effective, that it, everything they say is confidential and that everything will be accurate and complete and that you're going to use a first person. So this solution that you have here is the one I use and the one that I have tweaked along the time. And so I always say, good morning, Mrs. Mubarak. I use, do you have in Arabic the formal you? Or like, you know that you have the, in, in Spanish, we have the informal and the formal. So the formal, we use it with older people, people we don't know. It's kind of like a respect thing. Yeah, we can use uh, formal, like hadrataka, hadratki, say it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So any solution you have in Arabic, or for example, if you know the last name of the lady or the guy, you can say Mrs. or Mr., why? Because in English, we have something called um, like the personal space that draws a line. But our cultures, like Hispanic culture and Arab cultures, we're interconnected. We're a community. And especially if it's someone that has been struggling with finding someone that speaks Arabic, they're going to be super excited to see you. And they don't see you. They see you as something that be, someone that belongs to them instead of a professional providing a service, you know? So this is the way I draw the line and I always talk to them in formal, like in, in a formal sense, like usted, like Mrs. Mister. My name is Gloria, I'm a Gloria. 
And I will be the interpreter today. The reason why I started saying the is because when I said your, they think I'm going to be on their side and they have expectations. So it's funny because you know what, even though it's just one word, it changes a lot. And, and I have tried this in the field. And when I say I will be your interpreter, they feel I'm on their side when I'm supposed to be neutral. And then they start expecting things from you like, oh, and they start telling you their problems and things that you really don't need to know because that's when things get complicated. I usually ask, have you worked with an interpreter before? If the answer is yes or no, it doesn't matter. I still, I do it because I want to know and I use it if they tell me no, oh, so let me explain to you how this works. And if they say yes, I say, oh, so you already know this and I still do the precession because you never know if the previous interpreter did a precession with them, you know? And you never know if the previous interpreter had bad habits, which I see all the time. I tell them, I'll be your voice in English and the providers, so doctor, nurses voiced in Arabic. Why do I do that? I used to say, everything you say, I'll interpret into English and everything the doctor says, I'll interpret into Arabic. But the problem is most of the time, people don't know what an interpreter is. So if you say, I will interpret everything, they're like, mm, I don't know what she's gonna do. She's here, she speaks English. I assume she's gonna say what I say. And the other thing is, I like to say, I'll be your voice because I feel that empowers them. And it shows them that they have to say things. We're not there to hold their hands and take them through the road. We're there to allow them to communicate. So you see how even like psychologically it's different. That's why I like doing it. And this is why I don't say, I'll say everything you say, because to me it's implied. Because sometimes they tell you things and then they tell you, don't tell him I said that. So with this, they have to understand that whatever comes out of their mouth, I'm going to say it. Everything you say is private. I used to say confidential, but I realized that they don't understand that word because sometimes their educational level is not as, as high as ours. So I say everything you say is private or anything you say won't live here because sometimes they think you're going to go and tell their pro about the problems and that's when they stop talking and that's how they service to them you know and the other thing is if you're in a small community they may think that you're going to go and tell i don't know someone else you know that's the fear people have they don't under because again when they don't know our role they don't know that we have um that kind of like interpreter patient confidentiality so they may be scared that whatever they say we're going to tell them i don't know the mom so they're scared and they won't say anything and please speak in short sentences that's it's like inshallah because that usually doesn't happen <laughs> okay so that's my solution once you have this they should know and it's really simple good morning mrs blah my name is gloria i'll be the interpreter today have you worked with an interpreter before? No, yes, oh. So you have worked with an interpreter before? Well, do you already know that I'll be your voice in English and the doctor's voice in Arabic? Everything you say, it's private. And I use my hands a lot because I think it helps make the point reach across. And please speak in short sentences. Shook them. And then you hope for the best, okay? If there's not, not enough time, make it simple. I'll be your voice in English, the provisor's voice in Arabic, and please speak in short sentences because we need to improvise, adapt, and overcome as interpreters. But it works because I've tried it. Situation, the provider asks how much medication the patient takes per day and how many times. She said 10 milligrams three times a day, but you interpreted 100 milligrams three times per day. You made a mistake because you know what? We're human, it happens, okay? So what do you do? You stay calm. You, you, because sometimes when I make mistakes, I'm like, oh, I'm not good at this. What am I doing? Do not self-flagellate. And then you said the interpreter. We usually talk about ourselves in third person. No, we always. The interpreter would like to correct the amount she said or she stated or he stated. The patient is taking 10 milligrams three times per day. And then you jump back to interpreting. And that's why I like note taking because it helps prevent this issue. Sometimes when either the doctor or the patient is talking about numbers, a writer 
rather write it down, write them down in the language that they're um, saying it because when I interpret, it's easier for me to look. It's kind of like I write them thinking in English, but then I read them thinking in Spanish. And that's how I don't get confused because I've tried to keep the number in my head and it kind of gets funky. It's like, that's how my brain works. So if you know how your brain works, you can prevent issues. Next situation. The patient and provider keep looking at you, the interpreter during their encounter. That happens a lot. And they also keep telling you, tell him, tell her. And you're like, Ugh. what do you do? This is how I fix it. I use my body language to show that they have to address each other. So you see here how Obama and Pelosi are looking to the ceiling and most likely people start looking at this. That happens because it's human nature because you want to know what are you looking at, you know? So what I do is the following. So you see um, to the left and up there, the doctor starts talking to the patient. The doctor started looking at the interpreter let me see if I have a pen here. Oh, I have a pen here. So you see here. Ah, I knew it was going to happen. Uh -huh. So you see here, the doctor was looking at the interpreter, and the patient was looking at the interpreter. So what I do is, when the doctor starts talking and looking at me, I start looking at the patient. So the doctor gets confused and starts looking at the patient and then the patient starts looking at me. So that's usually how it starts. There's some trainers that tell you that you have to raise your hand and say, this is interpreter speaking, please look at each other. I'm here to support your communication. I don't like that because I feel it's intrusive and it starts, uh, it's kind of like riding a road with a lot of bumps. So I like doing like this, I call it micro interventions. I just, the guy's looking at me, I just go, and I start looking at the patient so that, because I can hear the provider. And then the provider starts, is going to start looking at the patient. And then when the patient starts looking at the interpreter, what I start doing the same thing. I start looking at the doctor, and then the patient will start looking at the doctor, and then they will start looking at each other. I've done it, and every time I do it, it works like a charm. The only thing is sometimes I need to keep an eye on the patient because sometimes they say things and they touch themselves. I just repeat, it hurts here because I'm there to support the relationship between the provider and the patient not to replace it. So they should be looking at each other anyway. But I've noticed that there's a lot of providers that um, what they do is they say the message in English, they throw it at you, and then it takes time to you to you um, to go from English into Arabic, get the answer in Arabic, and then turn the an answer into English. So they use that time to start writing notes. But the problem is they're not developing a relationship with the patient, right? And they're not looking at the patient. And sometimes the patient says it hurts here. And then um, they, don't, they just don't look. So that's how I do it. Next situation. The provider is new. Sometimes they don't, they've never worked with an interpreter. And they keep using a high register terminology. It means they keep using words that are very medical during the encounter. And the patient doesn't understand it. This is when we need to stop and think, are you assuming the patient doesn't understand or the patient really doesn't understand? So those are two situations because I've seen that people sometimes underestimate patients and they think that because they don't speak English, they're not that smart. That's not usually the truth. I have had patients. I had one that was an attorney in Tijuana, but um, just in Mexico. I'm in San Diego. And um, it just, he, he wasn't good with languages, but he was an attorney. So it doesn't have to do with anything. We always keep the register. Why? Because I cannot assume that the patient doesn't understand. Because of body language, sometimes people are quiet or sometimes people start looking downwards or sometimes people don't have any questions or they're not making eye contact. In our culture, making eye contact to someone that's like higher than you because they have more education or they're male 
or they have we perceive them that they have more money you're supposed to be respectful so you don't make eye contact and in america people are supposed to make eye contact with the person they're talking so that's something that i see happening we cannot assume that a patient doesn't understand because they're quiet um and it's happened to me that i asked a patient um do you have in the, the provider finished saying what he had to say and what i use what i usually do as a cultural um adaptation is when the provider ends saying something i say any questions even though the provider doesn't say that because the anglo provider is um, used to working with an anglo patient and in in the um, u.s healthcare culture the patient is his or her own advocate so if the patient doesn't understand something the doctor knows that he doesn't need to say any questions because the patient will ask any questions if he or she has any but in our culture, we don't ask questions because asking a provider a question means you're doubting what they what they told you need to do. So we perceive it, we may perceive it as being uh, disrespectful. Or sometimes, you know, the pay, the doctor says, well, we need you need to pick a treatment. And in, in the States, the doctor gives you options and you pick your treatment, right? And in our cultures, the doctor knows more, so the doctor is going to tell me what to do. And if the doctor says I need a surgery, who am I to say no? Who am I to doubt by asking a question? Or, is, or sometimes it's a woman, for example, and she needs to figure out when she can have a knee surgery. So the woman starts thinking, okay, I need to go home, talk to my husband, because who's going to pick up the kids from school? Who's going to cook? Oh, now my mother-in-law has to come help us. Oh, my God, no, I don't like her blah, blah. So you never know what's inside of the head of the patient. That's why the worst thing we can do is assuming. And that's why um, I usually let after the provider ends the whole, his whole spiel, I just tell them any questions. So I give them a chance to ask a question. And then if they say, nope, that's it. You know, halas. I don't poke them to ask questions because this um, student told me, oh, I always tell the doctor, I think she didn't understand. And the, I, I have the doctor ask, tell her to say a question. You know, you're, I know you mean well, but you're putting the patient in a really uncomfortable situation where she was fine, you know? So I know you mean well. It's so like, oh, I'm telling the provider to ask her, hey, you want to ask a question? But you know what? Maybe she really needs to go home and figure out her whole life before she can come back and says yes i'll have the surgery or yes i'll have the shot so it we mean well when we put the patient in a really uncomfortable position does that make sense yeah <laughs> okay assume nothing as interpreters we cannot assume nothing because it's happened to me when i was told i needed um surgery for my esophagus in 2016 it happened to me. The doctor kept talking. He's like, you really need surgery. I'm like, okay. And then he kept talking and my mom was listening and I was just like, what am I going to do? I live in the States. I need to have the surgery in Peru. How am I going to pay rent? What am I going to do? I need to stay in Peru for three months. So I started having this conversation in my head and he kept talking. I was just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gone. That didn't mean that I didn't have any questions. That meant that your brain goes somewhere else. And it happens, you know, so it happened to me. That's why I can tell you patients sometimes it's not that they don't have any questions It's sometimes their brain goes somewhere else. So if you say, Hey, Gloria, any questions you're ask, actually putting me in a position where I'm <laughs> going to make a mess out of myself, you know? So again, we keep the register. And if the patient doesn't understand, they're going to go like, huh? Ish. <laughs> because we're their voice. You need to let the patient make his own mistakes. You need to let the patient say, I don't know. I don't understand. It's the right. Sometimes, again, in our cultures, we try to help them save face or not look like they don't know or not look ignorant. But you know what? Maybe, the, maybe not. The doctor needs to know that information to change the way he's talking to the patient or maybe change his treatment based on the patient educational level. And how do we pick educational level on the questions they ask, on the question, on the way they um, ask questions or the way they react. So sometimes we try to like clean it a little bit. It's like, I'm going to clean your face so the doctor doesn't think you're, you're stupid or illiterate. And we're not doing the patient a service. I know we mean well because we don't want to let them look bad. 
but in the long run, we're replacing the relationship they have, you know? So we're their voice. If they say what, <laughs> say what, you know? And we're in the US healthcare system. So like I said here, um, the patient is independent. You should be able to ask your own questions, navigate the system. So instead of helping them be independent, so when you're not there, they can be do things on their own, we're crippling them, you know? We need to encourage them to be their own voice and their own advocate because the day Zeni is not there or Amina is not there or Hippo is not there, what's going to happen? What's the patient going to do? He's just going to sit there and go like, well, my interpreter's not here. Who's going to take me to the pharmacy or who's going to tell me what to do? So instead of helping them be independent because you mean well, you're actually doing that in service to them, you see? So again, this happened to me. This was a new doctor and he told me, um, ask the patient if she has diplopia. I knew the patient and I really knew that she had no idea what diplopia was. So I said, diplopia? Like, do you have diplopia? I said that in Spanish. And she said, the what? Like, what? What's up? And then I interpreted that, the what? And that's when the provider realized, oh, I'm using words that are too complicated for this patient. And they, he lowered the register. He said, oh, do you have any double vision? I interpreted double vision in Spanish. And he says, ah, no. And then I interpreted back that back to the provider. So I teach in conferences and I teach on my own. And this um, interpreter, I don't know where, it was one conference. This interpreter told me, oh, you know what, when that happens, I don't, I just lowered a register for the doctor. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm a doctor. And I don't do that because you know what? What if the, pay, the provider said diplopia and you got confused and you said blurry vision? You know, because again, you mean well, you want the patient not to feel bad because he doesn't understand that word. And you go like, the doctor says you have diplopia and you turn around and interpret, do you have a blurry vision? And the patient says, well, and you turn around and say, no. And it, what happened? What if the patient actually had double vision and this part was a, a very important um, part for me to diagnose what's going on with the patient. And I, as a doctor, don't have that information because you wanted to lower the register to do me a favor and to do the patient a favor. And you gave me the wrong information. The doctor makes a diagnosis based on the information we interpret because the information we interpret comes from the patient and we make diagnosis from what comes from the patient. So you see how you meant well, but you actually messed it up. So that's why it's so important. And, and I tell her, look, I'm a doctor and I don't change the register. He needs to know that she doesn't understand because sometimes the educational level tells me how I should change the, the, the treatment because sometimes there, um, if I do something too complicated, the patient may not do it and that's going to backfire because the patient's not going to get better and that's not what we want. Next situation, the provider uses a term, the interpreter does, has never heard before when addressing the patient or the patient uses a term the interpreter has never heard before. What do we do? Because the same thing as in Spanish, in Arabic, we come from different countries, we have different accents, and we have different words for the same things. So, for example, um, I may be Iraqi, and I'm interpreting for a Moroccan lady, and they're going to use a word I've never heard, or a word that we usually call different you, back home, you know? We don't need to know everything. It's impossible to know everything. What do you do? Take a deep breath and you ask for clarification. Asking for clarification, I think makes you a stronger interpreter because some people tell me, oh, that's so embarrassing. How can I ask for clarification? I don't know everything. The, per the first person that tells you they know everything, run because I don't know half of what they think they know. So what I do is I tell the other party, so either the doctor or the provider or the patient, I am not familiar that. So the way I look at this is the patient gives me information, like a, like a, oh, the patient gives me a ball in Arabic 
I look in my bag if I have an equivalent ball in English, and then I give the ball to the provider. Then the provider gives me a ball in English. I look into my bag and I'm like, oh, I have the ball in Arabic, and I give it to the um, Arab speaker, right? That's how I look at it. So what happens is if the Arab speaker gives me a ball and I look and I'm like, I don't have something like this. Like I don't have an equivalent in English. I just look at the person because this, this game goes like this, right? So the English speaker is waiting for you to give him a ball. And if you start telling the lady, what do you say? Cause I don't understand cause I'm Iraqi and you're Moroccan and yeah, I don't understand. What does the provider think? they feel left out that's kind of rude to be honest and they feel left out and like what are they talking about the soap opera a recipe what are they doing because they feel left out but if the person that's expecting the ball you turn around and go like dude she said something i am not familiar with you never say i don't know because i'm not familiar with sounds more elegant <laughs> and so I usually tell them uh provider this is interpreter speaking the patient used a term I'm not familiar with. I'm going to ask for clarification. And he'll say, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. so go ahead. go ahead. So now he knows what the interaction between us are speaking in Arabic is. And then I can, I can, I usually tell their, because um, most of my patients are Mexican. I tell them, ma'am, um, I'm from Peru. I'm not familiar with the term you use. Oh, it's blah. I'm like, oh, okay. Sometimes I know the word in English and they throw the word in English. I'm like, oh, why didn't you say that before? Or they explain it to you. And I'm like, okay, cool. Now I know. So they gave you a ball. You have an equivalent for in your in your bag. And then you can go and give it to the provider. That's how it works. Do not have pearl of feet. Do not have a side conversation with the person who used the term. Because the person that's expecting the ball will be confused. Again, diplopia. So you tell the patient that's expecting you to come with a term. In Arabic, the provider used a term I'm not familiar with. So I'm going to go ask him and I'll be back. And then she goes like, oh, that's cool. One second. I dropped the ball. I'm not familiar with. I'm going to ask him. And then she knows what's happening. Because if you were an Arab speaker and then you see your interpreter having a conversation with a provider, you start wondering, am I going to die? Did she say something bad? what's going on, and that can happen, you know? So again, this is an interpreter speaking. I'm not familiar with the term diplopia. Could you explain it to me, please? And they go like, oh, it's double vision. And you go like, oh, double vision in Arabic. And I said, la. And then again, always avoid side conversations because they're not nice too. Situation. This patient is frustrated and angry because he's been waiting for hours for the provider and his back pain is unbearable. This happened to me, actually. The doctor comes in smiling and he asks him, how is he doing? The patient loses it and starts cursing at him because we waited for like an hour and a half outside. And you know how it is. You wait an hour and a half outside. They make you come into a little office and then it's another 45 minutes. He was angry. What do we do? This is the fun part of a job. We interpret everything that's said. I started cursing at the doctor because, um, and I've had um, students tell me, I cannot curse at the doctor. I'm like, dude, you're not cursing at the doctor. The patient is cursing at the doctor for you. And that's fun. <laughs> Why? Because we already told them we transmit the message accurately expressing all the information conveyed in one language into the equivalent and we need to elicit the same response at the original if and what happened is the patient had this really bad bad back injury and that went through his legs so he couldn't be sitting down for more than 10 minutes so he was sitting down standing up and the, and the doctor came in smiling he's like hey mrs Gar mr garcia how are you doing today how am I doing? How am I doing? How the F do you think you're doing? My back is effed up, blah, blah, blah. And I was more concerned because he was Mexican. So I was trying to have the same equivalent in English because he was cursing in Mexican. I'm like, I think I'm supposed to, this means this. So I was more concerned about being like giving a fair equivalent than the doctor. Remember, the doctor's not going to get mad at you. And if he gets mad, that's on him. Because remember, if the patient, if you had a magic wand and the patient 
was able to speak English or he was able to speak English, would he curse at the doctor? Most likely. So who are we to take the patient's voice, you know? Oh, but, but I don't want the doctor to get upset. That's on him. If the patient spoke Arabic, I mean, if the patient spoke English, that he would insult the doctor because the doctor needs to hear his frustration because of his pain. If I went, oopsie daisies, oh doctor, yes, my back is a little bit messed up. It doesn't convey the same meaning. And the doctor's gonna say, oh, his pain is not that bad then. I'm just not gonna prescribe what I thought he needed. So you see how it even changes the person's reaction. So remember, we're not cursing at the doctor. We're being the conduit and it's fun. <laughs> Next situation, you're interpreting for a pediatric patient. You have been told in class to speak in the first person I, but the kid you can tell he's getting confused. What do you do? It's okay to use third person he or she for pediatric patients or children, older people, because sometimes they get confused, and psychiatric patients. Because sometimes psychiatric patients already hear other voices, so if you're there and you start speaking in first person, they're like, oh, maybe she's not there and I'm just imagining her. They don't need to hear another voice that's not there. And sometimes when it's culturally appropriate. And when you realize that you're doing the first person situation and it's causing more confusion than helping, that's when I do it. That's why I'm telling you, this ethics class is for real life because people that teach you from the book will tell you, oh, no, no, you always have to do this. In life, there's never an always and a never. You need to adapt, you know, because not every, so not every problem has one solution. That's why I teach this class. Next situation, the encounter is over. And the patient tells you, of course, when the provider lives, I didn't understand instructions. Can you just like repeat it to me, whatever you remember? What are you supposed to do? Do you just go like, oh yeah, so he said this and this and this, and then you go on with your day? Never, because you know what? You're the interpreter. You're not their mom. You're not their wife. You're not the sister. You're not the caregiver. Patients need to be responsible. And, and this, this happened to me after I, the doctor said, okay, that's it. See you in two weeks. See you in four weeks. And then I, when I interpreted, I added, see you in four weeks. Any questions? And the patient said, no. And then the doctor left. He's like, oh, how was the treatment supposed to be? And I'm like, dude, I just gave you the opportunity to ask about the treatment. And um, of course you didn't do it. So you're the interpreter. And the first person thrown under the bus is the interpreter. Okay. It's always, oh, I didn't do it because she told me that I had to do it three times. Even if you said what the doctor said and the patient decided to go do something else, you're opening the door to be blamed because that's human nature. So what I usually do is I'm super polite. It's like, ma'am, you know what? I don't remember, but I can go get the provider so he can explain it to you. And I smile. I never remember anything. Even if I remember, I don't remember anything because I don't want to be responsible if something goes wrong, you know? I'm, if I do it, I'm putting, it's shame on me because I'm doing that to myself. So what I do is I, um, what, what happened is I stepped out of the room. I saw the doctor's physician assistant and I just raised my hand. I'm like, hi, um, um, the patient wants the doctor to explain the treatment again because she forgot. So I never said, the doctor asked, the patient asked me if I can repeat that's how I tweak it. So I'm not inside of that mess. And then she's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. After he finishes, I'll let him know so he can come and talk to you. Okay. And then I sit down and I waited 10 more minutes. I'm still getting paid. And then the doctor came like, do you have any questions? Oh yeah, I wanted to know. So if I don't do this for my knee, what am I supposed to do? And that was it. But the thing is, I never told the patient, oh, the doctor said you're supposed to do this and this and this, because what if, she, if I remembered incorrectly, or what if the patient misunderstands, the interpreter told me this. And we need to avoid that at all costs, because we're always the one that are thrown under the bus, A, and B, it's not within our scope of practice. 
But the problem is if a patient asks you, so what did the doctor say? This is interpreter speaking. This is not within my scope of practice, so I cannot help you. The patient is going to perceive you as robotic or you don't want to help me. So this is how I solve things without getting involved. And that's how I stay out of trouble because I've seen people go like, oh, yeah, I just told her what the doctor told me. What if it goes wrong? Again, what if a patient misunderstands you too? What if you didn't remember correctly? What's going to happen? I don't want to be part of that mess. You're interpreting, next situation, you're interpreting during an encounter, the provider leaves the room for one second. It happened to me. The patient looks and says, I don't trust this doctor. What do you think? I don't know who the first time I'm meeting this doctor, you know? Never ever stay in the same room as a patient. That's rule number one. Because when you do, things like this happen. The doctor said, oh, I'm gonna go get this form she needs. And then he left the room. And as I was like this standing, she's like, I don't like this doctor. I don't trust him. What do you think? And I'm like, one of the things I was told during um, the ethics training for court interpreters here in California that I love is interpreters don't think, interpreters don't have an opinion. And I thought it was great because it gives you permission to go like, sorry. But the problem is you cannot tell, ma'am, interpreters don't think, interpreters don't have an opinion because they perceive you as cold and they can report you too. Don't send me that interpreter, I don't like her. So first off, never stay in the same room, but there are times that you can't avoid it. Like that happened to me because I was like standing up to go stay out of the way. And what I told her, ma'am, I'm the interpreter. I cannot give you my opinion since it's not my scope of practice. I don't like that answer. So what I did is, ma'am, this is the first time I'm here, lie. Even if you're there every week, this is the first time I'm here, so I don't know this doctor. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you. Which one feels better to you if you're a patient? Mom, um, this is interpreter speaking. I cannot give you an opinion because that's not within my scope of practice. Or, you know what, ma'am? This is the first time I'm here. I don't know him. So I wish I could tell you something. Sorry. Which one feels better as a patient? The second one. Which one keeps you out of trouble? The second one, because the first one, they can report you to the agency. I don't like this interpreter. She's not warm. Because as Hispanics or Arabs, we expect our interpreter to be warm because you're my people, you know? My people is warm. How can you not look out for me, you know? But the thing is, that's when we get in trouble. And I had this patient tell me, oh, but I'm sure you have interpreter for other doctors during your career. So they usually start like, we say in Spanish, they start polishing you like, um, just tell me what you would do. I won't tell, I promise I won't tell it. Yeah, they, they promise you they're never going to do something. They end up doing it. I promise I won't tell you anyone. And that's when I did this, ma'am, you know what? Every case and circumstance is different. Um, I don't know your case. And even if I did, I'm not a doctor in the States, in Peru, I'm a doctor here. I don't practice medicine, but I'll tell her, she, they never know I'm a doctor, never. And um, in the States, you need to make your own decisions as a patient, but I'll happily interpret every question you have. Which one feels better? Like, and, and again, you're empowering them because they need to learn. We need to teach our people that they need to ask their own questions because our culture is different. So there's this is more like a like more than a language shock is a culture shock, you know. And I'm like this, I'll gladly interpret that for you. And they feel you more like warm, it's like, oh, she said she's my voice. Isn't that great? I'm like, yeah, because I want to get in trouble. Okay. <laughs> I'll happily interpret everything you have to say. And then uh, next situation, the doctor told the patient that he needs to have a surgery to repaint his meniscus. Then he left to get a form and told the patient to think about it. And then the patient asked you, what would you do if you were me? Again, what would you do? Never ever stay in the same room with a patient. Again, there's times when it happens. And uh, ma'am, I'm your interpreter and cannot make a decision for you. I'll happily interpret any questions you have. Mm. I usually go like, oh, you know what? 
I don't know because I don't know your situation. Because they, they, sometimes I tell it, well, what would you do if you were me? Because they assume you heard the same information, so you're equipped to make the same decision. I'm like, you know what, ma'am? When I interpret, I don't remember things. I, it just comes in in English and comes out in Arabic, and I, I don't remember what he said. Okay? That's the solution to the problem. If you don't remember, how can you make a decision? But you know what? If you have any questions, I'll gladly interpret them for you. So you're the positive, happy, go lucky interpreter. But the thing is, you're dodging a bullet because I, I've seen people go like, oh, I told him that he needs to have the surgery because, yeah, I've seen other patients that have gone through that. I'm like, oh, what would you do that? You don't know the patient's situation. You cannot tell a patient what to do because that's not within your scope of practice, A and B. What if something goes wrong? They're going to say the interpreter told me I needed surgery, so I got it. That's when you get in trouble, you know? Next situation, the encounter is over. And the patient, and this happened to me too, they asked, he asked me if I had a car, which where I was going, and if she could give you a ride. What do you do? Actually, the encounter was about to be over. She's like, so do um, you have a car? Yes, I knew where it was going. So which way are you going? And I remember she lived south, so I told her I was going north. <laughs> Some patients, this is why we use formal you. Some patients don't have clear boundaries. They think that because you're friendly, you're their friend. And you know, in our culture, if you're my friend, you're going to do things for me because that's how we are, right? If you work for a hospital, Yay, what you can do is you can tell the patient, you know what, um, I cannot give you a ride, but we can go to this apartment where they can help you. So you throw the ball at someone else, but someone that can fix it, right? And if you're an independent contractor, uh, I, I have told someone, I, ma'am, I would love to give you a ride, but it's against the company's uh, policy to do so. But you know how our people are. I'm not going to tell anyone you know they're going to tell everyone. Oh, she's great because she gave, gives me a ride every time I go to the hospital. People talk, especially our people, they're very communicative. We're very chatty. That's what we do. Okay? And always with a smile. Well, in this case, what I told her is, I told her I was going north. When I knew she was going south, she's like, oh, okay. Masalama. <laughs> Problem solved. Situation. It's Christmas time. Or it's um, Ramadan. Mrs. Salamuddin, this sweet old lady, you have interpreter for a long time, shows up with a little present for you because you know what? We're in America. She looks American. I'll give her something because I like her, you know? It's a scarf she needed for you and she gives it to you. It's a present that happened to me. What do you do? You need to think about your culture, you know? She needed this present, so she made it herself. I knew she was on a fixed income. She brought the yarn and she needed a present. So is rejecting the present rude or offensive? If within our culture is rude or, or offensive? So you need to think, if I accept it, what's less rude? If I accept it or if I reject it? And it depends on what the present is, you know? So um, is it going to affect the existing relationship I have with the patient? Yes, it will. Because sometimes people, usually they give you food as they give you love in their culture. It's like I, whenever people go to Peru, I'm like, prepare to be overfed because we give you love with food. So you can, you can never say, oh, just a little bit. No, it's not going to work. But when you're an independent contractor, you cannot blame the hospital because when you're working at a hospital, it's like, I'm sorry, it's against hospital policy to do this. So you can hide behind the hospital policy. But when you're an independent contractor, that's when you have to think, what's better? If I say no, if I say yes, you can decline politely. Like, I would love to, then you blame ethics. But again, it depends on the present. In this case, it was a scarf she knitted for me in blue because she knew I like blue. So that was going to break her heart. So I just accepted it. But um, see, again, if you work for a hospital, sometimes I tell you uh, how much is the max amount for presents, or you can take it to your manager and let him or her decide. A friend of mine that worked at a hospital told me if it's food, I just take it to the interpreter lounge and we share it. So it's fine. But um, when it's money, 
Uh, like this guy wanted to give me money after I interpreted because he said, it's just for your coffee. And I'm like, sir. And I knew he was on fixed income and he didn't have enough money. So I told him, sir, the fact that you think that what I did is good is thanks enough. Thank you so much. And I had my hands like this, like you kind of put money in my hands because they're like this. So I was like, thank you so much. You really, your comment really made my day. Thank you. And that was it. Because getting money is kind of weird. But a, a friend of mine that works at a hospital told me that what they tell them is, do not give me the present, just donate it to the hospital. That's a good solution too. But if you don't work at a hospital, because most of us are independent contractors, that's when you, it's funny. Next situation. The encounter is over. Oh, see, they want to give you money. What do you do? If you work for a hospital, uh, you need to become familiar with the a hospital policy and then um, make an issue to the hospital. If you're an independent contractor, tell them, sorry, sir, you've been happy with my performance is the biggest reward you can give me and smile. Next situation, I help a patient fill out her intake paperwork in the waiting room because in California, uh, when they, they give us paperwork, I just cite, translate uh, the question, the patient gives me the answer and I write it verbatim in English. So we went into the doctor's office and the, the doctor patient, when the doctor asked the patient, what can I do for you? She looked at me and said, tell him what I told you outside. And I was like, what's going on? That's never happened to me before. That, that really happened to me. I was like, oh, what am I supposed to do? What I did, I interpreted for the provider, tell her what I told you outside. And the provider, thank God he was used to working with interpreters and he realized what happened. So he went to the patient and told her, no, 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 no. I, she's not, the interpreter's not my patient. You're my patient. I want you to tell me what's wrong with you because I'm going to be treating you, not her. And then I interpreted, no, 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 no. You're my patient, not the interpreter. I, I interpreted everything into Spanish. And then the patient was like, <clears throat> and then she started talking. But the thing is, remember, culturally speaking, the doctor is higher than the patient and the interpreter is like down here, right? So if I had stopped the encounter, which is what some trainers do, when this happens, you're supposed to stop the encounter and tell the provider, provider, the, inter the patient doesn't understand my role in the communication, so I want to remind her that I'm a conduit. And then you go to the lady and go like, ma'am, like I told you before during the pre-session, I'll be your voice in English. Da, 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 da. You see how this makes the encounter longer. It's like a huge pause in the communication. I don't like that. So what I did is whatever she said, I interpreted for the provider because he has the right to know. And the other thing is if I explain it to the patient, she will not like it because to her in the food, in the food chain, I'm lower. But if a provider who's up here higher tells her to do something, she's going to do it. And it worked because when, a, when, a provide, when I interpreted what a provider said, and she could tell because most of her patients can speak a little bit of English and they understand, but they don't feel comfortable speaking in English. She understood what he said because she was like, Rrr. and then she started talking and say, what was wrong with her? I'm not there to be, I'm there to be her voice, but not to replace her voice, you know? And then the patient started talking and then the encounter flowed. So instead of me interrupting it, telling the provider, the interpreter needs to remind them that I, I don't like doing that because I think it makes the whole encounter bumpy. That's not my style. Next situation. I have interpreter for this patient before, you know she's allergic to penicillin. The provider asks if she's allergic to anything, the patient is just distracted and she says no. And the provider is going to prescribe an antibiotic. What do you do? Ooh, see, that's a good one. When the patient's health and well-being or dignity is at risk, that's when we are an advocate. The problem is, I don't like this word because it sounds like I'm going to be defending the poor patient. I think it should be called mediator or entangler more than an advocate, but that's what we do. You raise, that's when you raise your hand is that the interpreter would like to say that I ha she has interpreter for the patient before, and I believe, I believe she's allergic to penicillin. Okay. Or for example, for, um, before a surgery, sometimes the a nurse comes in, the anesthesiologist comes in, the nurse in the OR comes in, and then the surgeon comes in and they ask the same question. So what if she said 
two times that she was allergic to penicillin and this time she didn't say it and someone forgot to put the waistband because mistakes happen you know that's when you can save someone's life and then you jump back to interpreting next situation patient used a folk disease that the interpreter is not familiar with or it doesn't have an interpreter in, uh, in equivalent in english what's a folk disease is a disease that is not in medical books for example um evil eye that means a person with a lighter color of eye has looked at my kid and now my kid is throwing up and has diarrhea and all that stuff we don't have that in medical books so it's something that a culture believes for example um in Japanese uh, culture, they believe that they people can turn into werewolves. I saw that in a psychiatry book and I thought it was fascinating. Okay, um, so that happens. So what do you do? Because there's not, e like the evil eye does exist in English because also it's, it's something we have in Hispanic culture, Jewish people also believe in this, so it's more prevalent that something, <clears throat> more we have we in hispanic culture we say that air hit us so that's why you have a pain on your back and it could be a muscle spasm or it can be like a urinary tract infection that's getting up there so but we said the air hit us okay so what we usually do is you interpret it as such if it says the air if the lady said in, in arabic for example the lady the air hit me i say in english the air hit me why because I want the provider to ask for clarification, you know? And, and for example, and the other reason is because sometimes one disease, one, one fold disease means one thing in one country and it means something else in a different country, okay? So what if the air hit me in Morocco is I have a muscle spasm and the air hit me means I have a headache in um, Lebanon, you know? You never know because things vary a lot from country to country. So that's why, again, we cannot assume. So the ones that ask for clarification, and the other thing is I want the provider to say, what's that? Because that way the patient's going to explain. You know, does it make sense? And this is something, it's a cultural thing, and they believe in that, you know? Every culture has their own interesting folk disease, and you're like, ooh, interesting, okay? Sometimes it's a disease, and sometimes it's a treatment. You know, sometimes they tell you, um, for example, in Hispanic culture, we use Vicks Vaporub for everything. You know, like I, when I was working as a doctor in Peru, I had this patient with an upper respiratory tract infection, and I was like talking to him. I'm like, okay, can you please remove your shirt so I can... Um, check your lungs and then I hear crack 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 and I'm like what's that noise he had put like a thick layer of beaks and then newspaper on top so I look at him and I'm like like he couldn't see me I'm like sir so what's this all about always super respectful because I really wanted to know it. I don't really want to offend him just because I don't believe in something that doesn't mean I cannot be respectful or that you know and then um he told me oh that way the air comes out because the newspaper sucks the air out of my lungs through the beaks I'm like oh interesting but you know what I just need to take it out because I, I need to hear your lungs so I took it out I cleaned it I check his lungs and then he's like can I put it back I'm like yeah sure because there's some some mix on the newspaper so I just put it back <laughs> he put his shirt back on and then I gave him his treatment and he's like can I do the mix oh yeah keep doing it because it doesn't hurt and I was super, just because I don't believe in something, that means I can be disrespectful, you know, always respectful. And then this happened to me before. The surgeon, um, I have interpreted for him many times. He actually knows I'm a doctor. He told the patient she needs a procedure you're familiar with. And when she's, um, she said, what's that? And then the doctor told me, oh, Gloria, you're familiar with that. Why don't you explain it to her? And I was like, mm -hmm. Um, a, I don't get paid to do your, do your job, but I didn't tell him that, obviously. B, what if I explain it as I think it is, and he's doing it for another reason, you know? And it's not my scope of practice. I don't get paid to do his job. So what I did is, I, um, you can do is I would gladly interpret that for you. Because is it within your scope of practice? Nope. 
And that's when we get in trouble, when we mean well. The other thing is um, this doctor told the patient, we're going to PNS you, which is to, to declare you permanent and stationary. And in workers' comp, that means that the patient, ha we have done everything and anything medical for the patient, and she reached a plateau and she doesn't get better or worse. So that's when you declare her permanent and stationary, and then you close the case. So he told the patient, we're going to PNS you. So I interpreted in Spanish, we're going to PNS you. We're going to declare you PNS. And then she said, what's that? Because I wanted her to ask the question. And then she, and I told him, what's that? And he said, come on, Gloria, you know what that is. And then I looked at him and said, oh, I do, because I didn't want to look stupid. But I'm pretty sure she would prefer to hear an explanation from you than from me. And I went like this. And then he said, okay. And then he explained it, and I interpreted that. So there's many ways to get out of these situations when you don't have to say, doctor, this is interpreter speaking. Within my standards of practice, that's not my, within my scope of practice, I'm sorry. I can interpret it for you because people are going to complain and they're going to tell the agency not to send you again because you're annoying. Yes, that's what we are supposed to do according to the book. But in real life, which one is seamless and which one makes you look good? <laughs> situation the patient's pregnant and the baby died overnight the OBGYN is recommending a therapeutic abortion to be performed it goes against your religious and the patient's uh, religious beliefs and the patient's beliefs what do you do our job is being a conduit of communication we cannot tell the patient what to do we're impartial so you need to keep your personal values, beliefs, or biases outside of this situation, of the relationship. So what, even though you may feel uncomfortable, and you go like, she's a good Muslim girl, of course she's going to say no. But the thing is, you need to give her the option to say no or to say yes. So what you do is, you tell yourself, I'm doing here a job which is transmitting the information, it's up to her what she has to do. Because I heard the situation of, um, actually it was an Arab interpreter that um, the husband was hitting the lady and the doctor was trying to figure out if, if there was domestic abuse and he was asking the domestic abuse questions and the interpreter, when the, the, say, the lady said, yes, he hates me, the interpreter started talking to the, to the lady and the provider didn't know what was going on. He's like, you know that you have to be a good wife and stay in your marriage. He started giving her like instructions of what she should do instead of just interpreting. You need to, because you, I know you're a good Muslim woman and you have to stay with him and, and like God knows what he does things. So I was like, no, you're just supposed to transmit the information. I know this person, I'm pretty sure he meant well, but that's not your job. The one that has to, to do that is nobody. She's supposed to be the voice, okay? Situation. You go to interpret to an uh, OBGYN appointment and you see a lady who goes to the same mosque you attend. Then you realize that she's the patient you will be interpreting for. Because sometimes, again, our communities are small and you see people at the mosque or they, your kids go to the same school together and then boom, she's your patient for an OBGYN appointment. What do you do? It's not ethical to interpret for family, friends, or acquaintances. So because and willingly, we can be a bad filter, not because we're not saying the correct words, but she's editing what she's saying because she doesn't want to say that she had an STD or that she had an abortion or that she has had three miscarriages or you never know what she doesn't want to say, you know? And this important information can be left out because of shame or fear. So you can, what you can tell a provider is, I'm acquainted uh, with a patient. I would like to excuse myself. Or the other thing that happens is, again, when the, communi when the community is small and there's no other option, is you or nobody, you can tell, that's when you tell the patient, the provider, um, providers, interpreter speaking, I know the patient because our kids go to the same school. So let me uh, assure her that everything she says is going to be confidential and it can be up to her if she wants me to stay or no. Because it's also the patient's right to go like, yeah, no, I know you're a gossiper. I don't want you to interpret for me. Get me someone else. I don't care if he's a guy. Get me the phone. Because sometimes 
when there's not an interpreter, they can use the phone and they'd rather use a, a, someone they don't know than someone that's there. But let them make the decision too, you know, because if you were them, you would like to have that option. Um, other situation that I'm pretty sure may have happened to you guys. You're grocery shopping at the store and you bump into your patient's mom. She recognizes you because sometimes patients go to appointments with the mom and she says, Ethelene. And then she tells you, oh, have you heard about my son's lab results? Because I haven't seen my son in a while. What are you supposed to do? Are we supposed to tell the mom of a patient the patient's information? No, because of HIPAA regulations, okay? Ma'am, I would love to help you, but I see so many patients, I don't remember. We never remember. We have really bad memory. That's why we take notes, okay? And the mom's like, but are you sure? You, I know you're such a good interpreter. You have such good memory. Oh my God, it's bad. And you don't want to tell me what's going on, blah. And then she starts crying in the middle of the shopping mall. Mom, I understand where you're coming from. So always show empathy, but I cannot give you any information. I'm so sorry. Seriously, I don't remember. I interpret for so many people that actually, if I was telling you something, I would not be being accurate. Because people don't understand that there's rules. In our cultures, rules are meant to be broken or bent a little bit if I know you. You know how it is. So they're going to go like, I'm not going to tell anyone. The first thing they're going to do is go tell the son, um, Ebalik, you didn't tell me that you had low anemia. Now you have to come home and I'll cook for you every day and blah, blah, blah. And then the patient is going to go like, how do you know that? The interpreter told me, and then he's going to go and report you. And again, you meant well, and look what happened. Okay. Uh, another interpreter asks you, hey, Amine, what are you doing Sunday morning? Let's go for brunch. You tell him, nope, I can't because I'm attending this webinar that's very important with my Arab friends. He tells you, that's boring. It's a waste of time. What do you do, Amine? You tell them, that may be your opinion, but as interpreters, we need to continue honing our skills. I don't see it as wasting my time as I'm investing in my development as a professional. <laughs> okay? And then you drop mic. Hey, yo, like that. And that's the end of my ethics presentation. Uh, that's my email. That's my website where you can get more um, webinars in English because my Arabia is Shreya. And shukran everyone for being here. Thank you for having me. And I hope I was able to teach you a trick or two because this is more tricks of a trade than like ethics for the test. That's why I always specify this is ethics for real life because the book and the test is completely different. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gloria. It was very nice of you. Thank you. One second, I have a question. Of course, Ooh, uh -huh. question, I questions. Questions. We'll open the mic for questions now. Okay, go ahead. I love the questions. Yay. So, uh, can I start? My name is Kamar. Thank you very much, Gloria. It was um, very helpful information. Um, I work as a medical interpreter in uh, three hospitals here in, in, in Southern California, and I had a very um, we're, uh, I've been through a very weird situation and I, I didn't know how to react. So mm -hmm. one day I was sitting with a patient in the waiting room and, um, I figured out that she is, um, from a royal family, um, from Kuwait and, um, uh, she started talking uh, about the manager of the international office in the hospital that he stares at her in a, you know, sexual way. And he asked yeah. her um, kind of question, embarrassing questions. And uh, 
she start uh, she started telling me that he's a womanizer um um and um like he can't do this i can force him to do this for me and and i felt so embarrassed i i just i didn't i didn't know how to just go i don't want to listen i don't want to listen like, oh, cuz i don't know she might go someone's yeah, calling she <laughs> might go and tell uh, someone in the office or tell a friend who knows the manager that i was sitting and with the interpreter combination is one never ever but that's difficult because you know what again people that provide training and they don't work as interpreters i can tell who they are because they give you really weird answers you're like that doesn't work like that you know when i tell you you cannot stay in the same room as the patient i'm like dude in southern california they see you as a as a combo the patient and the interpreter go into the same room the patient and the interpreter go everywhere together and this this happens you know so the mm -hmm. only thing i can tell you is you need to prevent it from happening so um when i'm in a waiting room it's like i i get there i i do my pre session like everything you say blah blah blah, blah. then i ask her is there any paper we need to fill out paper we need to fill out okay cool and then um i just um i just tell her i'm going to tell the from this lady that i'm here and then I tell him, yeah, I'm here. And then I go and make the point to see if she's here, I sit here. Okay. And then I always have a book with me, you know? Mm. So I just start reading. Oh, I pretend you're working on your phone or tablet or something. Just yeah, 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 yeah. I just, you know what, just pretend. And, it, and But you know what, sometimes you have chatty patients. And then, mm. um, and then they and then she may you may sit here and she may stand up and come and sit next to you because again sometimes they don't have anyone to speak in arabic with and they get excited because you're there and you're their people yeah, true and and th that that's <clears throat> normal you know especially arab it, arabic is not a language it's not like spanish that you have anyone here in california at most it's a very spanish. similar it's a very similar culture by the way very you similar know what's culture. interesting mm -hmm. like most of my arab friends they were hispanic but they spoke arabic like it's, my it's best funny friend, by the way, my best friend is from Peru. <laughs> See? So you know yeah. what? Like uh, when I met the Saudis, they taught me how mm. to say stuff in Arabic, and they mm. would freak people out because they would say, "Just say your name is Nura," and I'm like, "Oh." Okay. Mm. So they're like, "Oh," da, da, da. and I'm like, "Oh, Aslan was Aslan." I would give like the the, the cute, very lady-like handshake, and then Nura, what's the same? Mm. So that's how they train me to freak people out and that we we have a very similar culture so, so let's say she started is like is she start, oh, if 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 you have your book so that's why you need to have several levels of uh -huh. of uh of how you fix it so i always have a book and if they and when people look at you it's like oh, i'm reading for a test they don't know you have a test like oh and i'm reading for this class uh-huh uh-huh so it's uh -huh. like oh she's so smart because in our culture we respect education so if you're getting education i'm not going to interrupt you so that's good. The second one is some people don't care and they want to be heard. And they see yeah. you, again, they see you as their people because you speak the language and mm -hmm. they want you to know so they know what to do. So once you start saying like, you know what, there's this manager, uh, blah, blah, blah. The first thing I do is show empathy. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry to hear. You don't say, empathy means I'm sorry to hear that. No, oh my God, that's awful. He's mm. a pig. You never use adjectives like that because he's your boss. So you're stuck in a really weird place. Yes. So when I go like, oh, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Empathy. You know what? I used to be to work at a company. I was customer care. The most difficult thing to say was I'm sorry for something I didn't do. Because I didn't do anything wrong. But people like to hear empathy. So sure. you're like, I'm so sorry. That's not right. Or, and you don't, no, no, don't even judge. It's like, I'm so sorry that happened to you, period. Don't even say that's not right because you're giving, issuing a judgment and you're yes. not in a court. So it's like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. But you know what? Um, let me see who can help you with that issue, period. Mm, mm, mm. So you are giving the ball to someone else because even and she's like, no, no, but I just want to tell her what happened. I understand. But sometimes when we tell a story, then when we have to tell it again, we forget. <laughs> and I work for the hospital and I want you to feel you have someone unbiased that can listen to you. Mm. 
And I had also um, been through another situation. Um, the assistant of that manager, she filed a complaint about me. And uh, so it was In this case. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's a situation. I would say it's a teaching moment for all of us. True. Then um, always remember in the foot scale and we're here and they're up here. So they're always going to believe the provider more than the interpreter, even if we have a recording, which we can't have, right? So I didn't have a complaint that, from the provider, Gloria. It was from but the it, assistant. It, yeah, but the thing is, she still higher than you in the food chain. Yes. And if she says you did something, they're never going to believe you. Even if you go True. first to True. say something, they're never going to believe you. They're always, and, and the other thing is, they are the clients and yes. you are the employee of the company. And they, they cannot have complaints from the clients because that means they lose the contract. Correct. So they'd rather lose you than lose the client because they're the source of income. You're replaceable to them, you know? I guess. And they yeah. always are going to, to believe the client. So I guess so, the, the question, the question here is just the question like, here. It, look, if if your company already dealt it with you, I would not do anything. I would just like lay low. If something say, if someone says anything, is like just smile and says I uh, made a mistake. Because sometimes you know what, making a mistake, saying that you made a mistake, I think it's good because it makes you look like you're acknowledging you did something that wasn't that halal <laughs> so yes. um and and the thing is to the to the doctor's assistant to her to have small talk with the patient is okay but not you because you're there to interpret so how dare you do something like that that's why i'm usually like if they ask me for my opinion i just smile um and just like if they're talking i just like <laughs> which feels kind of weird because i'm very talkative but i don't want this to happen to me you know sometimes yeah. you should not be yourself in order to stay out of trouble because if you had just been like mm -hmm. like i once it happened to me that it was a uh, psychology uh therapy one-on-one -on -one with a psychologist and it was the patient's last um, appointment. And the psychologist said, here we talk about our feelings, blah, blah, blah. So I interpreted what the patient said. And then she looked at me and said, and now you. And I told the patient, and now you. And she's like, no, 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 interpreter. Here you're supposed to talk too. And I'm like, I'm not going to come and talk about my problems with the patient and the provider. That's not how things work. So you know what I told her? Uh, provider, this is interpreter speaking. I really appreciate the opportunity you're giving me because she's giving me something, you know, in her head, yes. she's giving me something. I really appreciate the opportunity you're giving me, but given that it's the last appointment for Mrs. Garcia, I don't want to take any time away from her. Mm -hmm. In case she her, came, I don't want to participate. Uh, let's give somebody else a chance. I think you uh, had a. Yes. Uh, yeah. Anyway, anyway, so the thing is like we, we do have like crazy situations every day. I mean, I agree with the fact that each situation is different and we do have we're, the same we're, fun, we're fun people. Yes, and I hate and I hate when the I, I don't want to say that, but like when patients bring like some assistance case manager who speak, you know, Arabic or Spanish sometimes. That's it. Yeah. Especially like they interfere with, you know, interpreting and stuff. But I agree with like yeah. being like away from. Anyway, so thank you, Gloria, for the valuable information. And uh, the, quick, the quick question I had is just for the pre-session. I mean, there is a pre-session with the patient. Is there a pre-session with the provider as well? And what, what really, because theory? they're brief and uh, yes, I agree with you. Theory is the really different of what theory we Theory is beautiful. Every yeah everyone speaks standard spanish everyone speaks standard arabic they speak in short sentences mm -hmm. they do that when they are asked a question they answer in three words and they don't tell you a soap opera of how they got injured back home or correct, how many correct. kids they have and they don't uh, uh, it's beautiful like theory is beautiful with the provider what i do is i usually manipulate i know it sounds awful but i manipulate them <laughs> or so so when that provider told me, um, you can explain that to her, 
I didn't go like this is an interpreter speaking um, your voice in Spanish. I just told him like, I'm pretty sure she would rather hear that. I would, I know the information because I didn't want to look stupid. Because if I had told him, I'm not familiar with what PNS is, when it's something people say all the time in workers' oh, right. comp. I know. So, A, I, I didn't want to look stupid. So I said, oh, I know what it is, but I'm sure she'd rather hear the, hear the explanation coming from you than from me. So I just, and the other thing is providers that work with interpreters, they kind of know what they have to do, but there's some that, other interpreters do things for them that he should be doing. For example, there's this doctor who who got into a fight with a friend of mine because he got into the into the office and he's like, "What's wrong with her?" And he's like, uh, "Doctor, I'm an interpreter. I can interpret that for you." He's like, "No, no, no. What what's wrong with her? Tell me." And when that happened to me, it's when I first started interpreting. He's like, "What's wrong with her?" I'm like, "Oh, oh, 28 year old female patient with an onset of three weeks." Well, she was, I started giving her the, the summary as if I was an intern in <laughs> medical school. It's, it was crazy because he said that, like, oh, 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 24 year old patient, blah, blah, blah. and I started doing that. And then I'm like, what am I doing? And he's like, wow, that was impressive. But then I've never been, have to interpret for him before. But a friend of mine, she got banned for that office because she told him, you're the doctor. You have to ask him and I'll interpret that for you. I'm like, what happened? They yeah. banned me office because this doctor has his ways but that's the other thing <clears throat> when I was working at a hospital back home you learned that every doctor has a way to do things true, so true. then you tweak your approach Adapt. to what they like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so for example there's this doctor that he kind of speaks Spanish so he can do the physical exam by himself so I don't interpret that because the patient understands but um, he knows his limitations. So that's great because when it's something complicated, he looks at me and then I jump in and I interpret. So it's very seamless because he has been working with interpreters for a long time. But then, for example, this doctor asked the patient, have you experienced diplopia? And I'm like, dude, there's no way a lay person knows what diplopia is, you know? So I just interpreted that. So she could go like the what? Like the ish? And then she he realized that he had to lower the register, but I didn't have to explain that to him. So there's ways that you can tweak it Make slash it manipulate back. it exactly. so they can do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. Because the, the beauty of the pre-session is you're telling the person, because some people tell me, I don't do that. That's stupid. And I'm like, dude, you're telling the patient the rules of the game. So if something happens, it's like, I told you, everything you said will be interpreted. But the problem is, when I used to say everything you, you say will be interpreted, they don't even know what we are because they call it translators. Do you think they know what interpreter is? That's why I started saying um, your voice in, Eng in English and the doctor's voice in Spanish because A, they know that everything that comes out of their mouth will be interpreted and B, you're empowering them. You know, like I'm here so your voice can be heard. And I've noticed that patients kind of like go like, oh, I have a voice now. They get excited and they start speaking. You know, because in our culture, sometimes they don't want to um, be perceived as rude or be disrespectful to the provider. So that's how I do it. I just tweak it, especially when you know the doctor, okay. you know how to do it. And I have like this cute, cute ways to like dee, dee, and dodge <laughs> bullets. Transition. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, so, 12, and I don't want to waste uh, too much of your time. So, like, it's okay. Just one more tiny question, and then we leave the Okay, it's, that's okay. Yeah. I don't have anything else uh, going so, on. Gloria, <laughs> yeah, you were able to give us situations for medical interpreters, Arabic medical interpreters. Mm -hmm. So, this situation is for you now. As a, mm -hmm. as a doctor with your background, you know, you see that the doctor, the provider, is a, like wrongfully like diagnostic and like a wrong procedure. And that's something you're sure that he's wrong. So what would you do? That happened to me once. Oh, of course. I was, uh, I was called to interpret. Uh, uh, this lady was, she, they're like, there's a lady in labor at the hospital. Can you go? I'm like, sure. And then I get there and um, the lady started talking to her, her friend. And she's like, I don't know what they want me to dilate if the doctor told me I need to have a C-section. And I'm like, because usually in the states if you had a c-section the, the next babies are c-sections so yeah. yeah 
And then she's like, but I'm hungry. Oh, we can go to McDonald's. So I'm like, if she's dilating, she's been told that this baby is definitely a C-section. She uh-huh. has been told to, she can go eat. That's when I, that, that's when I, that's when advocacy, but I call it cultural untangling comes okay. in and I'm like, ma'am, can you repeat what you said? Oh yeah. I asked her, the lady was here before, which was, um, she wasn't an OBGYN. Yes. She was a nurse. No, mm. midwife. Oh, the midwife and that I was hungry she said I could go have McDonald's I'm like can you wait here for a second yes so I just went outside and I I'm like um the patient has a question and um you need to cut this off the patient which, which, has a which was your question actually <laughs> okay <good. laughs> yeah uh, um she she has been told that she can go to McDonald's so she wants to know if she can leave now and then the doctor was like she was told what? No, 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 no. She's going to go get a C-section. How is she going to go talk about? Hold on. Everything stopped. And the reason why I did it is because based on my knowledge, I know that was going to be a mess because if she ate, mm-hmm. she's going to not, she can throw up during surgery and it's going to be a mess. So that's when I made the executive decision that I had to say something, but it's not also only how you say it is mm-hmm. what you say is how you say it. So it was like, the patient, because she want, she said that she wanted to know she could leave. And I'm like, let me go as the provider. So that's why I say, hi, provider. I'm, I'm the interpreter. The patient would like to know if she can go have a, a McDonald's before her C-section. <clears throat> and it's like, what, what, cool, what, which one? Give me the chart. What? And then it exploded. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, I like to approach it. And, uh, the, Hiba had a question earlier. Yeah, sure. Regards, yeah, yeah. like she, I don't know if she can, she's still with us or not. But I will ask her question. That after interpreting in a legal setting, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, she was in the. Hi in guys. The, okay. Yeah. Hi Hiba. Hi, yeah, you. I'm here still. Excuse me, I apologize. My question will turn the whole situation into legal interpretation. That's okay. uh, because, yeah, because actually I did the written exam several times. And here in Kansas, they do not let you know which part is your weak part. So they just oh, give you the sucks. overall. Yeah, they just give you the overall test. You got like 60 out of 100 or 70 out of and even I ask, they say no. So even if I did the exam several times, I'm still seems making the same mistakes because I do not know which part I am bad in. Mm-hmm. So one of the other, one of the questions I feel that the scenario that there one section is giving you scenario as an interpreter in a court, and you need to choose the right like choice. Mm-hmm. I remember one of them that till now I am confused about the answer. Like you are an interpreter in a case and uh, the judge convicted like the, that person with a couple of years in a prison and everything is done. And you are now in an elevator going back home after everything is done. Uh, in the elevator, there are two persons or, you know, they're speaking together. One of them from his like speak, it seems he is the brother of the person that will go to prison. So he's telling the other person he will go and he has a knife and he will go and destroy the tires of the car of the other who the other person who put his brother in jail. So you as an interpreter, what would you do? The, the option that do nothing. The other option was that you need to go to tell the judge the other option is that you need to go to the nearest like police officer or you know man anyone in the premises that dealing with security and let's explain the situation to them so i I cannot remember the fourth actually you know the fourth uh, choice but in this case what will what i should do as an interpreter i would take the stairs No, usually when I see stuff like that and I see people mm-hmm. getting in the elevator that were in my case, I just wait for the next one. I just stand there and play with my phone. I'm like, okay, are they gone? I do that with medical patients too. I, like I, I'm trying to walk more now. So they're like, mm-hmm. oh, are you going to go in the elevator? No, I'm going to take the stairs. And yeah, but like, this what? was a question <laughs> in the exam. So. But this is that, like in the exam. No, I know. I mean, Damn. It's di- it's difficult because you know uh, what? I said you say nothing. Uh, it's not our job. I say I say you would say nothing. 
yeah. because you're not supposed to get involved. Mm -hmm. And uh -huh. uh, but you cannot be usually, interested. you know what? In ethics, I've noticed mm -hmm. that the the less invasive answer is usually the right answer. You know, because mm -hmm. common mm -hmm. sense tells you, oh, I should go and warn people. That's usually not the good one. But because mm -hmm. yeah, you're supposed okay. to be neutral. Okay. Hey, but you gotta but, be careful. Like, but, you better, you gotta okay. be careful too, especially if that's illegal. That's another word. In the ethics, they yeah. do have a, ca a canon which says like that you have to state to report impediments. So if there is like mm -hmm. person's life in danger, if if he tells you like he's gonna kill somebody or somebody, you need yeah, law like, to report that. So anyway, that's yeah. That. This is but that's what like, makes me. This is, this is what confused me. Yeah, this is as a person because I'm not an interpreter anymore. I am a person in an elevator listening to a conversation about a bad thing will happen to a person so you know what i mean this is what i thought of at the beginning yeah but if See, it's, it's somebody it's, in danger yeah it's mm -hmm. kind of tricky you know? yeah yeah i feel that these are you know those scenarios i mean sometimes there's not a decisive answer yeah. for them each one of us will behave according to what he believes would be the right thing that's that's why it is like uh, by chance you will you will give the right answer that it is recorded in the computer as the right answer. Yeah, I think I think that's great. I mean, having the theoretic like uh, portion is important, like the basics. But uh, in addition, uh -huh. we have uh, we have like a lot of experiences. I'm I'm pretty sure everyone has like personal experiences. Mm -hmm. How to deal with those experiences? That there come. There come, uh, therefore, come uh, comes uh, the uh, importance of the uh, experience, uh -huh. experience effect, because each situation brings you for the next mm -hmm. one. But, mm -hmm. No, and you mm -hmm. know what? It's and it's also who created the test because right. I've seen at NCI when they had the um, the CD, which is the court interpreting uh, training. Yeah. They mm -hmm. would sit on a table. It was like ten trainers, and they would ask ethical questions and sometimes they will have mm -hmm. one answer and sometimes they would fight for hours for the right answer so again it depends mm -hmm. on who you ask you know so for example yeah. to me it would be uh if they're just gonna slash some tires do nothing mm -hmm. yeah because i'm not yeah. there as an officer of the court because i'm off mm -hmm. you know yeah but then yeah. If someone says, okay, what if, because that's the problem with ethics, you know, you, you know, the right and wrong. It's like, okay, what if after slashing the tires, a person comes out like, yeah, but that's not part of the question. How am I supposed to know all that? You know, mm -hmm. yeah. that's why yeah. for, but well, that's why this class is like for real life, because mm -hmm. in this case, if I mm -hmm. see that one of the people is getting into the elevator, I just take the next one or I just take the mm -hmm. stairs because I don't want to put right. myself in a situation where I really do not know what to do. Well, or, or you know what? Mm -hmm. Maybe someone mm -hmm. lied on the stand and then you mm -hmm. hear, oh, yeah, they believed when I said that I didn't do it. And you're like, oh, but I interpreted it. She said she didn't do it. What am I going to do now? What are you supposed to do? You're not mm -hmm. supposed to do anything because you're there as mm -hmm. a regular person. Like it's like you took your interpreter cap mm -hmm. off and you're like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. So right, that's that's the thing. That that's why I'm telling you prevention is so important because yeah. if you mm -hmm. prevent the situations, you don't get into mm -hmm. problems. Right. Okay. So right. if you do precession, right. mm -hmm. everyone knows what's mm -hmm. happening. If you see that someone's getting into the elevator, or they're mm -hmm. taking the same road, I just mm -hmm. grab my phone, play with my phone for a second, text my mom, whatever, mm -hmm. and then I just wait for them to walk a little more, and then I walk because that's when they go right. like, "Oh, I have a question. I forgot to ask the doctor." And you're like, "I should listen to Gloria," mm -hmm. and then they start mm -hmm. asking you questions mm -hmm. that you don't have to under mm -hmm. to know. Sometimes you know what? I'm so into the interpreting that I don't pay mm -hmm. attention. I don't retain the information because it's in and out, in and out, in mm -hmm. and out. Right. Or, mm -hmm. or like it's so mechanical because you always say the same thing. They're like, I don't mm -hmm. know. It was like a, it was mm -hmm. a treatment mm -hmm. that he wrote down, and mm -hmm. then I, I she, he gave it to you. I don't know. Right. Or mm -hmm. I don't understand the handwriting. And she's mm -hmm. like, me neither. I'm like, well, go ask her. We can go ask together to his nurse. Right. So we can clarify it for mm -hmm. you. Like. Right. And you right. know what? Right. You're like, Ugh, I wanted to go home, but those extra five minutes that you go and clarify it with the patient. 
means mm -hmm. that she will be happy with the service you provide her because we're providing a service, you know? That's what people need right. to understand. We're right. providers of services, you know? Right. And the second right. thing right. is she mm -hmm. may be happy because a disgruntled mm -hmm. client is going to call the agency or sometimes agencies go, go like, hey, how do you like Heba? And you're like, I don't like her. She was not nice mm -hmm. to me because right. you didn't do what right. she wanted you to do. That is not within your mm -hmm. scope of practice, but the agency doesn't know. So that's those extra right. five minutes mm -hmm. means a happy client. Mm -hmm. Right, and right, you're compli right. you're complying with ethics, and you're fine. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. something you said that they didn't like. Like the other day, I, someone mm -hmm. complained about me because mm -hmm. it was a psychological um, session mm -hmm. that it had mm -hmm. another person. Mm -hmm. So it was a Spanish speaker mm -hmm. and a non-Spanish speaker. And when it's mm -hmm. like that with a with a psychologist, I interpret it simultaneous because I don't want there to be a lag mm -hmm. in consecutive. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more mm -hmm. real life. So mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. provider wanted me to write down as I was interpreting. And I told oh. her, providers, interpreters speaking, I cannot do that. I cannot do three things at the same time. Why not? Mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. I'm interpreting in simultaneous and that's not within my scope of practice. And it's just mm -hmm, like, Ugh, mm -hmm. okay, fine. And then mm -hmm, she mm -hmm. called the agency and told them not to send me anymore mm. that happened to me and then the agency called me like what happened and then i told her and she's also an interpreter and i told her i'm trying to think what it was of course i knew what it was oh, and oh. i interpreted it simultaneous she's like well some people don't like mm. it well she didn't she told me to ask mm. the patient how he wanted mm. to work with me and i told him that mm -hmm. like, oh that's <laughs> good i told mm -hmm. her yes mm -hmm. i did it and she was very mm -hmm. harsh mm -hmm. So I was like even extra nicer because I didn't want to get in trouble. And then she told me mm -hmm. that she wanted me to write down the instructions. And I said, "How? I'm sorry, I can't because I cannot do two things at the same time. And she's like, of course mm -hmm. you can. I'm like, well, I guess that's what she didn't like because that's the only thing mm -hmm. I can think of. I don't, because she wanted to right. talk to me before she called the place. And I told her, right. dude, I cannot interpret in simultaneous and write a summary of what she's saying. And she's like, mm -hmm. who can do that? I'm like, I don't know. I'm not that good, apparently. Because someone mm -hmm. must have done it in the past, but they must have been doing it. And even if you do it in consecutive, you're taking notes. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to right. write? I don't know. It was weird. So mm -hmm. she, And I told her, look, yeah. you've seen me interpret. You know I'm mm -hmm. not a crazy person. I'm so sorry mm -hmm. I'm putting you through this. Mm -hmm. So again, mm -hmm. apologize. I'm sorry you're going through mm -hmm. this because of mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. I cannot think okay. of anything I've done. And she's like, no, I agree with you. Don't worry about it. But right. I explained the situation and she understands because she's also an interpreter. But if it's someone that mm -hmm. doesn't understand, that's when you have to explain when I interpret, I'm in the zone and I cannot write mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. talk at wow. the same time. Same and that time. Was yeah. it. But that's happened to me. So mm -hmm. anything can happen. Situation. Yeah. But, but at least you know yeah. what you do if this yeah, thank you. occurs in the future so yeah okay. so yeah. see we we'll we'll learn from this stuff i think uh, what do you think right. Maria? <laughs> you're getting tired yeah. i bet i know thank you so I'm much yeah. <laughs> thank you so much thank you very much you're welcome it. thank you thank for you. having me i hope you enjoy the class thank you thank you thank Put you all those nice arabic words and <laughs> Right. Yeah, it was very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you. Right. Thank I told you it late. Thank you, Marion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Have a great rest of the day. You too. Thank you. Bye bye, guys. Everybody. Have a great. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Um,